verse 4. All right? And we're going to get started. I got a little different word for you uh, today. Um, it's actually going to be a Hebrew nugget for today. And uh, it's going to set us up a little precursor word. And then uh, the Sunday's following. I'm going to do some little 10-minute short Hebrew nuggets to expand upon this topic uh, alongside uh, our regular sermon. But for today, we'll do the whole sermon of Hebrew nugget. And so uh, look at Jeremiah 50 in verse 4. You got anything else, Prince? All right. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together. All right? So God is saying in those days, in that time, two groups are going to come. The children of who? Israel. And the children of who? Of Judah. All right? Two different groups. Two different groups. In case you don't know, we represent Judah. But there's still a group out there that represents the children of Israel. Right? We're going to talk about that in a little bit. And the Bible says they're going to come, the children of Israel and the children of Judah are going to come together, the Bible says. Together. They're going to, uh, they're going to come going and weeping. They shall go and seek the Lord their God. Right? He's talking about revival, not only in Judah, but in Israel. They shall ask the way to Zion, right, which is Jerusalem, with their faces pointed toward, or Tither word, as it says. I don't really say that word too good, so I say faces pointed toward. And here's going to be the thing. Come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Father, bless us as we go through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Say to God, as we, amen, represent uh, a church, amen, uh, that uh, the school of the Hebrews is is a part of, we believe, amen, that we are those people. Uh, we are those people specifically from the tribe of Judah, amen. We went from the fall of Jerusalem to Negro land to the transatlantic slave trade. And this is how we ended up, amen, in America, in the Caribbean islands, in South America, amen, and in Europe, the transatlantic slave trade, all right? We were scattered throughout the Western world, and scattered throughout the whole world. But today, I want to talk with you about the other tribes. You're familiar with the tribe of Judah. You know what's going on with Judah, amen. But I want to talk to you about the other tribes. You see, in our text in Jeremiah, he says that a day is going to come where the children of Israel and the children of Judah are going to come together. But we need to ask ourselves, amen, who would represent the children of Israel? And we're ready to talk about it right now. All right, I'm going to draw from, in this sermon, a few different sources. Number one, we're going to come from our Bible. Number two, we're going to come from the Apocrypha. Number three, amen, we're going to come from this book called A View of the Hebrews. It was written in 18, uh, uh, 1825 by Ethan Smith, who was a pastor. He's a pastor uh, in that day. Uh, we're going to also come from uh, this book, Star in the West, uh, a humble attempt to discover the long-lost ten tribes of Israel. Uh, this is written by a man by the name of Elias Boudinot. And just in case you think that these people are quacks or they don't know what they're talking about, Elias Boudinot was an attorney. He was a congressman uh, uh, in the 1800s. I think he wrote this book in 1816. He was a, an attorney, a congressman of New Jersey. And he was part of the first Continental Congress in shaping what we now call the United States of America. These are not, amen, people that you would find in the hood somewhere writing something that they don't know about. Amen. And these books, amen, that I presented to you along with our Bible and the Apocrypha, they're going to tell us, amen, not only who represents Judah, but who represents the other ten tribes. We're living in a day where truth has been hidden. We're living in a day, amen, that whereas what you see is not really what it is. We're living in a day where they have lied to us so much. They've lied to us so much, amen, that God, amen, is going to reveal what was, what is, and what is to come. It's the mystery of the ages, amen. I want you to just think about how wicked mankind is, all right? And I want you to think of the wickedness, amen, and ask yourself, do you trust them to have told us the truth about anything? Well, they haven't. 
They haven't. They lied about everything. Everything they told us is a lie. So we got to go back. We got to go back to the Bible first, back to the books, the historical books, amen. We got to go back, and we got to relearn some things, amen. You can't forget who's the ruler of this age, who's the God of this world. And it's the enemy, it's Satan. And Satan will never allow you to see the truth. He's been a liar since the beginning. But God is always going to allow the truth to come out, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I'm telling you up in here. And so we're going to talk about, amen, the ten tribes. Hallelujah. We'll have seven quick points. I'm telling you, we're going to go quick, too, because my time has already elapsed. The first point we're going to talk about is divided. Second point we'll talk about is sin. Third point is exiled. Fourth point, the promise. Fifth point, the problem. Sixth point, our seraph. Seven point, next time, which is just setting up for what's next. So let's begin with the first point. Somebody say divided. See, what you need to understand is that Israel went into Egypt, one nation. All right? We'll cover it here in a second. They went in 70 souls. When Joseph called for Jacob, they went into Egypt, 70 souls. That was it. There was one. Twelve tribes, but one people. They came out of Egypt, guess what? One people, all right? They move into the promised land, guess what? One people, all right? Saul became king, guess what? One people. David became king, guess what? One people, huh? Solomon became king, guess what? One people, all right? All right? But when Solomon was king, he began to sin against the Lord. He was the wisest man on earth in regards to some things, but the, the, the most foolish in regards to others, all right? Solomon liked the ladies too much. He liked the ladies way too much. All right? He had over a thousand wives. Okay? And the Bible tells us, amen, be careful not to be playing with all them little women because they're going to take your heart away from the most high God. Anybody hear me up in here? And that's what God told Israel from the very beginning. But Solomon, the wisest man in everything else, knew gardening, knew architecture, knew history, knew insects, birds, everything. But he didn't know, amen, about being holy in the area of sexual purity, okay? And so he had all these wives, and, and just like God said, he messing with women from Egypt, from this and that, amen. Whatever the woman you enter, hallelujah, whatever she enter, you're going to get into it too, all right? Because you yoke yourself, the spirit become one. Why a lot of men who never did drugs, amen, wind up messing with the wrong woman and find themselves on drugs. Well, Solomon messed with women who worship other gods. Mm. They worship Ashtoreth. They, they, they worship uh, uh, Tamaz and, and Molech and, and Baal. And so he, he coming in there, well, I'm just, that's just going to be my little woman. Cause whatever she into, that's not going to affect me. The devil is a liar. Yeah. All right? Whoever you lay with, you become one with. It's a soul tie. All right? That's why you got to be careful where you lay yourself down at. You can't drink from anywhere. The Bible says drink from waters out of your own cistern. Drink from fountains, amen, where you know where the water comes from. All right? Lest you get sick. Okay? And Solomon, amen, hallelujah, messing with all these ladies, amen, his heart turned. His heart turned. Just like the scripture said, I mean, it's for sure. His heart turned. And he began to worship the gods that his wives worship. Huh? And the Bible says that the Lord became angry with him. And we pick up, amen, in verse 10, or verse 11. Let's skip some things so we could be timely. In 1 Kings 11, 11, wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, for as much as, thou has, as, as this is done of thee, thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and give it to thy servant. God said, because you're not obeying me and you're worshiping some other stuff, all right, I'm going to take the kingdom from you. When he say rend, that means tear. It means rip. I'm going to rip it from you. In verse 12, notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David's, thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. God says, Solomon, I'm going to show you mercy. Because your daddy was so good to me, I'm going to take the kingdom, but I'm not going to do it in your lifetime. I'm going to do it to your son. I'm going to take it from the hands of your son. All right? Verse 13. How be it, I will not run away all the kingdom, but will give thee, how many? One tribe to thy son for David's servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. So this is God. He's upset with Solomon. He tells Solomon, listen, Solomon, I'm taking the kingdom away. But for David, I'm not going to take it away from you. I'm going to take it away from your son. And for David, I'm not going to take away all the tribes. I'm going to leave you one. 
All right? After Solomon dies, Solomon's son Rehoboam takes the throne. Rehoboam is king now. The people come to him and say, Rehoboam, your daddy was working us to death. He was building everything. He built the temple, he wasn't satisfied. He built a house, he wasn't satisfied. He built a house for his wife, he was just, we just building. We were building cities, we just looked. We was dreaming about wood and lumber and hay and clay. We were just, just building way too much. So they come to him and they say, lessen our load. Lessen the load. Slow down the work orders. Rehoboam said, give me a couple of days to think about it. He go to the advisors of his daddy, amen? The old advisors, amen, the gray head, the ones that rule with his daddy Solomon. He go to him in Tyrone and he say, fellas, what y'all think we should do? What would, what would daddy do? The people asking, the, lessen the workload. The, the older fellas, they look at him, they say, look, 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 grab ball. If you would just serve this people, this people will serve you for the rest of your life. Just lessen the workload. Be nice to them. Give them a good answer, Reb Boom. You know? And so Reb Boom said, okay, that sounds good, all right? And so what he do, he said, he not only asked the, the older, the elderly, who ran with his daddy, who he asked? His friend. The young crowd. All right? The boys who ain't never ruled nothing, never had nothing, but we got a lot to say about something. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? And sometimes advice from the silver saints is better than advice from them young babies. Anybody hear me up in here? If you're a young person up in here looking for advice, hey, man, you better start off asking mom and daddy. You better come to pastor. You better come to these some, some, some with the gray and their beards are in their hair. Amen. They gonna, they are no hair. They're they going to give you some good advice. All right. The shiny head. Go to the shiny head. All right. All right. But Rehoboam didn't listen to the advice of his father's counselors. He took the advice of his, of his, his, his peers. And his peers told him, listen, you answered him rough. You tell them people that if Solomon, hallelujah, uh, put this amount of work on you, that you're going to do double, triple, quadruple. And I'm just rephrasing, paraphrasing, but that's what, he, that's what they told them. They did it in a Hebrewism. They say, you tell them that your pinky going to be the size of Solomon's waist. You know, uh, you're you going to give so much more burden, so much more work. So what real boy do? He go to the people and answer the people rough. They come to him with a man by the name of Jeroboam. Jeroboam, what you going to do? You going to lessen our workload? He say, nah, I'm increasing your workload. And something happened, y'all. A division happened. Israel, who was one from the days of Egypt up until this time, a division, a chasm, a schism. And the Bible says, amen, hallelujah, in verse uh, 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 1 Kings 12 and 16. So Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them. The king didn't listen to them. The people answered the king saying, what portion have we in David? Why should we follow the tribe of Judah, the house of Jesse, the uh, house of David? They say, hallelujah, uh, 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 neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. You know what they're saying? Let's leave, let's leave Judah to itself. Let's leave the house of David. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed to their tents. Verse 17. But as for the children of Israel which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over him. Go to verse 19. We got to speed it up. So Israel rebelled against the house of David. Look what it says. Until what? This day. So from that time where the kingdom broke up to right now, the house of Israel and the house of Judah still hadn't been unified to this day still separate still separate and when you study the bible amen it can get a little confusing because you'll see a map show me a map sound boy. you'll see the map and on the map they'll have on the top they'll have israel and on the bottom you'll see judah you say well i thought it was just one country yeah it was one country until civil war broke off and the north was always called israel sometimes you'll hear them call them ephraim and the south was always Judah, which would be later term Judea, which is where we get Jew from, all from Judah. All right? Y'all up? Y'all still up out there? We working hard. We working hard. We going through some history. Somebody say divided. Yeah, 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 yeah. Point two, sin. All right? Sin. All right. The kingdom was given to a man by the name of Jeroboam. 
Jeroboam became king of the northern tribes. He got 10 tribes, y'all. And the south, Judah, have pretty much one and a half. We're going to say two, but it's really one and a half. They have Judah and they have Benjamin, all right? They have Judah and Benjamin. Benjamin just was mixed up into, into Judah. All right, we'll see that in Ezekiel here for in a second. So Jeroboam has the northern tribes. See, but the problem was, was that Israel was a nation that when certain feasts and festivals came, God called all the people of the nation to one place. They would all have to uh, 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 do a pilgrimage to that one city, Jerusalem, to that one temple. They would have to all come during either that Day of Atonement, amen. They'd have to all come during that Passover, amen. They'd have to all come during those, those yearly feasts where God said, I want all the men to report before me, all right? That was the problem to Rehoboam, or rather Jeroboam, because Jeroboam said to himself, he said, man, he said, I got the northern tribes, but every year, almost three times a year, they're going to go back to Jerusalem, to, to, to Rehoboam. He said, it's a big problem. And look what he says in verse, hallelujah, 26 of 1 Kings. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. I'm going to lose the kingdom. In 27, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of David, if they have to go back to Judah in the south, hallelujah, I'm going to lose the kingdom. 27, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall their heart, the heart of this people, turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. He said, I got a problem. They're going to go back to Rehoboam and go back to Judah. 28, he develops a plan. Whereupon the king took counsel and made what? Two calves of gold. He said, y'all ain't got to go to Jerusalem to worship. I'm going to make y'all some gods. And he said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. He made two golden calves. Now, let me tell you the problem with that is. The problem is that Israel should have known their Bible better than that. Now, you know that as soon as y'all got out of Egypt, Aaron make a golden calf, burnt God up, burnt Moses up. Moses woman took your head off, throwing the stone tablets at you. Ground up the golden calf, put it in some water, and made y'all all take a sip and drink it. Amen. If you would have known your Bible, you would have never let Jeroboam make two golden calves so you could worship him. But the Bible said, my people love it so my people perish for a lack of knowledge. When you know your Bible, you ain't going to fall for just know anything. All right? So Jeroboam made two golden calves. He put one in Bethel. He put one in Dan. He said, y'all don't go back to the temple in Jerusalem. Stay a part of the northern tribes. We got our own thing going here. And he introduces idolatry into the northern tribes early in their, hallelujah, inception, in their birth. Amen. They was already worshiping things that wasn't God. What you need to understand is the way that sin works is that sin don't get better and better. It get worse and worse. It's like, a, it's like a decline, a steep cliff. It's like a snowball coming down until it turns into an avalanche. That's the way sin works, all right? So if they started off with idolatry, how are they going to end? So the northern tribes in 2 Kings 17 and verse 16, look what it says. The Bible says, hallelujah. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God. This is interesting because, hallelujah, Cam, Jeroboam probably just started off, look, I just don't want y'all to go back to Jerusalem. Let's keep the commandments. Let's do what we got to do. Just look, these are the golden calves I want y'all to be around. But sooner or later, they left all the commandments of the Lord their God. They didn't just, hallelujah, make one molten image or two with these calves. They made more molten images, even the two calves, and made a grove. And they not only worshiped the two calves, they worshiped all the hosts of heaven. They began to worship the stars, the sun, the moon, huh? And they serve Baal. They introduce the false god Baal into the system. Verse 17, if, if that's worse, if that's bad, look what the northern tribes began to do. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire. Pastor, what that mean? Human sacrificing of their children. Because the way that these gods, Baal and Molech, would operate is they would ask you to sacrifice your babies to them. They would get parents to throw their babies in the fire or put their babies in glowing red hot hands of a, of, of, a, of, a, of a metal image. And when they would put them babies in the glowing red hot hands of these images, the babies would just burn up and die while crying while mama looking, you know. 
And what they would do is, amen, they would promise you these false gods. They would say, if you give up your babies, you're going to get prosperity. You're going to be blessed. And instead of getting the blessing from the Most High God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, their God, he said, hallelujah, he said, instead of getting water from, 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 your, own, from your own sister, and he said, you go to broken cisterns. That's what God told his people, you know, looking to be blessed someplace else when the blessing is already yours. And so they began to give up their children in the fire. Not only that, they used divination and enchantments. What's that? That's Cleo. That's Sister White, Bro Bridge Highway. You understand what I'm saying? Montel, all that. Divinations, astrology, telling the future, voodoo, hoodoo, throwing salt when people leave your house, burying things in people's front yard. They're using all kind of voodoo witchcraft, magic. He's saying they're doing all of that. He said, but people want to know the future, they should ask their God. That's what he said. That's what he said. And so they're doing all this evil. They're doing all this wickedness. Amen. The northern tribes are. Huh? And they sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. That's how they started with Jeroboam. But as the northern tribes continued, they had the worst kings, the worst queens. You remember a king by the name of Ahab and his wife Jezebel? That's the kind of kings and queens they had, y'all. They were doing wickedness. And what you need to know about the Lord God Almighty is that Devil, you're a liar, all right? What you need to know, what you need to know about the Lord God, the Most High, is that he don't like sin in the earth, no. But he especially don't like when his people sin in the earth. Anybody hear me up in here? And he told his people, you mess around, leave me, it's going to be some repercussions and some consequences. You mess around, start serving all kind of stuff and doing all kind of stuff. Listen, don't you expect to stay in the land if you're doing all of this and all of that. That's why I can't understand how these people could be over there in the land, amen, uh, doing all manner of wickedness in the land, amen, uh, 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 perpetrating uh, pornography, uh, uh, wicked TV, amen, uh, wicked financial systems, uh, human trap, all kind of stuff in that land. And they, they stand in that land, the, the Ashkenazis, amen, doing wickedness, and we say they the people. You don't understand the character of God. Because anytime God's people doing wickedness, Part of the deal is you're going to get out the land. Woo! Woo! Third point, exile. Exile. That word exile is just like the word exit. It means you got to go. All right? In 2 Kings 17, 5 and 6, the Bible says, after all that sin, God dealt with him. God says, then king of Assyria came up throughout all the land. That king's name is Shalmaneser. And went up to Samaria. That was the uh, northern tribe's capital. And he besieged it. He put a, a blockade around it where they can't get no food or water. For how long? Three years. And then the night year of Hosea, Hosea the, king of, the, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel. When he say Israel like that, he's talking about the northern ten tribes. He carried them away where? Into Assyria. And he placed them in Hala and in Habor by the river Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. All right? So when they did sin, God judged them. And when he judged them, he brought them out of the land into Assyria. Now let me show you some reliefs. I've shown you the Assyrian reliefs before. But now you know the context. They sinned. God sent Assyria in there. Amen. And Assyria warred against them, took them captive, and transplanted them in another land. Sambu, give me, give me that Assyrian relief. Amen. Uh, the little uh, 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 carvings. Amen. That Assyria had. You see, when Assyria took Israel out of the land, this is what the Assyrians say that the Hebrews look like with the dreads and the beards. Amen. Give me another one. Amen. This is what the northern tribes look like. Look at that. That's some brothers. Amen? That's some brothers. Go ahead and flip again. Amen? Hallelujah. Look at the BDB. Look at the BDB. Look at the BDB. All right? And we're getting back to that with our beards and everything like that. that. That's how it was. Amen? That's the northern tribes. Amen? Coming out of Israel. And you learn that when you talk about the Shunammite woman. Amen? Who is part of the northern tribe. When she say, I'm black and I'm beautiful. That's what she say. You know what I'm saying? I'm dark and lovely. Amen? 
Hallelujah. And so that's the way the northern tribes came out. That's what Assyria noted, amen, how the northern tribes looked when they came get us. Now, uh, or came get them, amen. Now, here we go, all right. Not only does the Bible talk about the Assyrian captivity, but the historian Josephus talks about it. And so Josephus is probably one of the best historians uh, for the people of, of God, the Israelites. Amen. And so he talks about the name of the king, uh, Shalamanazer, uh, king of Assyria. He talks about how they demolished the government of the Israelites, transplanted the people into Medea, Persia. And so this is a secondary source. You can find that in Josephus' work, the Antiquities. Now, let me cover something right quick. When the Assyrians took the northern tribe out of northern Israel, what they did was they placed some people in their place, all right? And the people they placed in the place of the uh, ten tribes were a mongrel nation. There was a, a, a culmination, a collage of all kind of different people, uh, Babylonians, uh, Cush, amen, all kind of people just mixed up into one, and they put them there in the northern tribe. In our Bible, it talks about them, all right? They say that those people that were there, amen, brought all kind of different gods. And they began to worship all kind of different stuff. And all of a sudden, the land of Israel began to attack them, the beasts, the lions, and they had no peace. And so they had a problem. They say, wait up, wait up, wait up. We're serving all kind of gods, and the God of this land is attacking us. So they sent messengers to the south, Judah, because we were still there. And they told Judah, they said, Judah, help us worship the God of this land so we can stop having all of these problems with the animals and everything else that's going on. So Judah began to teach them how to worship the Most High. Anybody hear me up in here? And that was a good thing, amen, but they would worship the Most High, but they also had, amen, still remnants of their false idolatrous system mixed up with the true worship of the Most High. These people would become known as the Samaritans. Anybody hear me up in here? Anybody hear me up in here? They're not the ten. The ten was moved by Assyria, and the Samaritans represent a people that Assyria put there to hold on to the land. It was a people, a mongrel people of Gentiles mixed up with a mixed up religion, idolatry, and the Old Testament. And fast forward to the day when Jesus was walking the earth, he stopped by the well of Samaria, and he met the Samaritan woman. You, you know what I'm saying? The, 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 the woman. And him and the woman began to talk, and she arguing with him about who got the better religious system. You see, because since they got a little bit of our religion, they felt that they was better than us, but that wasn't your land to begin with. You was transplanted, you see? And so she began to argue with you. She said, our fathers worship in this mountain, and your fathers worship in that mountain, and we got the well of Jacob, and we have all this and all that. And Jesus front on them. Jesus said, woman, you worship what you know not. Your people don't know the truth about who Yahweh is and this and that. We have to show y'all what that is. Y'all Samaritans transplanted here by the Assyrians. You worship what you know not. Jesus said salvation is of the Hebrews, and I'm going to show you what's really going on. And he began to preach to her. He said, a day is coming where we're not going to worship in this mountain or that mountain, but God is seeking for those who are going to worship him in spirit and in truth, and for those worshipers of God, is God what God looking for. He begins to just school her. You know what I'm saying? And they got some people that think that, hallelujah, we the Samaritans. Now, we're not the Samaritans. We're not the Samaritans. The Samaritans were transplants by the kingdom of Assyria. The northern tribe was already gone, and Judah was a whole separate thing in the south. And Judah had a feeling that, uh, of animosity against the Samaritans. Number one, they were Gentiles. Number two, they had a mixed up religion. And so, as the Bible says, the Jews, the Hebrews, had no dealings with the Samaritans. In fact, when we wanted to insult one another, when we wanted to burn each other up, we'd look at one another, we'd say, you Samaritan. That's how we would say, not you, Rand, I'm just saying. We, we would, that's what we'd say to each other. You see, just a little history record on the geographic geopolitical history of our land. The northern tribes were exiled and the Samaritans were put in that place. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But let me talk with you a little bit about the promise. Okay? When the northern tribes were taken away, Hallelujah, 
God still had a promise for them. Anybody hear me up in here? He still, he still had a promise for them. Okay? In Ezekiel 37 and 15, he talks to Ezekiel. And he tells Ezekiel, Ezekiel, take two sticks. And on one stick, write Judah. And on the other stick, write Ephraim. The stick of Judah going to represent Judah and Benjamin. And the stick of Ephraim going to represent the ten tribes, Israel and all of his companions, his fellows, his fellows, as the Bible says. And then God tells Ezekiel, he said, take the two sticks in front of everybody, all of Judah, and put the two sticks in your hand. And when Ezekiel put the two sticks in his hand right in front of everybody, the two sticks became one. And the people say, what in the world is going on? Because the prophets used to do stuff like that. And they wanted to know what the sign meant, what the omen meant, what is going on. Ezekiel, we see the two sticks, and God made the two sticks one. What does it mean? All right? In Ezekiel 13, amen, verse 19 is where we want to go, just to fast forward. it. God told Ezekiel, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, that's, uh, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows. So Ephraim represented the tribe of Ephraim and his fellows. And will put them with him, even the stick of Judah. Ten tribes in Judah. And in the future, he says, I'm going to make them one stick. And they shall be one in my hand. And the sticks wherein thou writest shall be in thy hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. 22. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be their king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Anybody hearing me up in here? He would take the children of Israel and the children of Judah and he would make how many nations? One nation. Pastor, what you're saying? What you're saying? Huh? The ten tribes in Judah are going to be one again. Point number five. We're moving good. But there's a problem. There's a problem. Y'all want to talk about the problem a little bit? All right? There's a problem. Watch me, Miss Leola, Brother Sam. Watch this, watch this, watch this. You see, a lot happened after the northern tribe was taken away from Israel. All right? After they was taken away, amen, Judah, amen, hallelujah, looked like they was going to stay in the land forever. But they began to sin too. They began to worship those false gods too. And, and, and Israel was taken away in 722 B.C. And, and following that, hallelujah, we was taken away in about 609 B.C., about 100-something years later. And what happened was, was that when we was taken away Judah, God did it through Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar came, surrounded, amen, and he took Judah, and he took us captive, Judah, captive, all right? When he took us captive, then we would write, we continued writing our books, the book of Daniel, amen, was while we in, was in Babylonian captivity, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, amen, Daniel throne, and then the den of lions, amen, all of that's going on while we in Babylonian captivity. Babylon falls, amen, to the Medes and Persians, Darius, huh, Darius. And Darius is in the book of Daniel as well. All right? All right? After the Medes and Persians, hallelujah, doing their thing, amen, we still taking notes, Judah, writing about our history, amen, and we in those, those foreign lands, amen, and a woman of God step up from our people by the name of Esther. The book of Esther is written while we in Babylonian captivity. Huh? And we in that land, and Haman give an order to kill all of the Hebrews, and Esther say, hallelujah, now nah, I'm going to stand up. If he killed me, I'm killed. He killed me. I'm coming, I'm coming, stand up for my people. Amen. Monica, I tell her, you was born for such a time as this. That's during the Babylonian captivity. Are you with me so far? All right? Time go on. Amen. We still in foreign lands. Amen. Hallelujah. Judah is. All right? 
And we get to a place where we want to go back home. And so the books of Nehemiah, Ezra are written. And Nehemiah up in there and Ezra up in there, they serving on the kings. And, and the king looked at Nehemiah and said, Nehemiah, why are you so sad? He said, how can I be happy when the walls of my city are all torn down? And so the king said, Nehemiah, go back to your city, amen, and rebuild the wall. So Nehemiah, the wall builder, come back up in there riding on his donkey, amen. Hallelujah. And he builds the wall. The book of Ezra is written. They rebuild the temple. Amen. And the southern tribes who was in Babylon, guess what happens? Through Cyrus, through Darius, and other kings, God sent the southern tribe back to Israel again. But does he ever send the northern tribe again? No. No. We go back to Israel. The northern tribe don't ever go back. In fact, History tell us that when the northern tribe was in Assyria, Assyria fell, and there was no trace of the northern tribes ever again. History forgot about them. Some theologians say that they, they were, they were uh, 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 exiled into extinction. Some theologians say, hallelujah, that they intermingled so much to where they don't exist no more. Pastor, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that God himself said that one day the children of Israel and the children of Judah are going to become one again and go up to worship him. But how can we go up to worship him when the other tribes are lost? Are you with me so far? Right? They were lost. Now we come back from Babylon, amen, and we in here, and we in Jerusalem again, and everything is going great, amen, but we start sinning again. Judah does. Oh, yeah. We start sinning again so bad, God put us under Roman authority. Hey, God. When we're under Roman authority, God see that we can't keep the old covenant at all because we just keep messing it up. So God say, I'm going to send you a savior. woo Since you can't fulfill the law, I'm going to send somebody to fulfill the law for you. And so Jesus come, who considered not robbery to be equal with God, but humbled himself to the point of becoming a man, hallelujah, a servant, and humbled himself even to death, the death of the cross. And we continue to sin against our God. The Bible says he came to his own, Judah. He had our hat like wool, feet like grass, look just like us. He came to his own, but his own received him not. And when they put him up on the stand, they say, they say, Hebrews, behold your king. We say, we have no king but Caesar. When Pilate said, who you want? You want Barabbas or Yeshua with Jesus? They say, they say, no, 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 no. Away with this man. Give us Barabbas. We rejected him, amen, and got Babylonian captivity. And when he came down personally to us, in the express image of God the Father, we rejected him again. Guess what's going to happen again? Exile and captivity. Now, when Jesus was on his way, carrying his cross, they was crying for him, brother Sam. He said, woman, weep not for me. <laughs> weep for yourself. <laughs> because if you think I got it bad, just wait what you're going to get for rejecting me the second time when, when I came in the flesh. And just, just wait. Yeah, yeah, you're weeping for me, but just wait. Just wait because judgment is coming again. You thought you lost Jerusalem one time. You're going to lose it again. And right after Jesus died, a few years after that, 40, 30, years after that, the Romans come got enough with the Hebrews. They surround Jerusalem in 70 AD. They kill so many Hebrews. They wiped the city clean. They, 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 they threw the temple down so bad, like Jesus said, they left not one stone on top of another. And we fled. We fled south into Africa, following the, Ni uh, the Niger River Valley, settling in West Africa in a place called Negro Land, waiting, amen, until the transatlantic slave trade would happen. And we would end up at 200 West Willow today. Come on, give God some glory. Anybody hear me up in here? All right. That's the Southern tribe. And we here. And our, our journey has been chronicled. But where are the other 10? 
What are the other ten? The last historical record we had of them is them in Assyria, but when Assyria fell, they, where are they? It's like that game, that, they, that little shorty, where's Waldo? Where's Ephraim? Where's Ephraim? Somebody say the problem. All right? But I want you to look at Jeremiah 31, 36. For those who say that the ten tribes are extinct, you got to go back to the word of God. You see, because God gives certain promises to his people. And he tells his people that you're never going to cease from being a nation before me. He tells them in Jeremiah 31, he says, if the ordinances, he's talking about the stars, the sun, and the moons, if they depart from before me, said the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. He's saying, if y'all could stop the stars from shining, and the moon and the sun. If y'all could stop that, then you could say that Israel is going to stop being a nation. But as long as they got stars in the sky, a moon in the sky, and the sun continues to do its thing, as long as there's seed time, harvest time, amen, as long as the world and creation continues to go, and I don't stop it until the end of days, Israel shall always be a nation before me. Don't you dare say it's extinct when I tell you it's never going to go extinct. Let God be true and every man a liar. He tells them in Isaiah 49, he said, Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should have not have compassion on the son of her womb? And for the mamas in here, you know what I'm talking about. God saying, Mama, can you ever forget a child that come out of your womb? Huh? Can you ever? It'd be a tough thing. And I don't care if you gave him up, hallelujah, but at night on your bed, you still think about that child. He said, A mother could never forget. And he said bad times may happen, amen, through drugs and, and, and just through the devil and his system. And he said, some, he said some may forget. He said some may forget. Yeah, 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 because trouble happened and people, people, things happen. He said, yeah, they may forget. But God says, yet will I not forget thee, O Israel. I'm never going to forget you. I'm never going to forget you. And in 16, he says, behold, I've graven thee upon the palms of my hand. You know, when you're you know when you don't want to forget something and you ain't got no paper? What you do? You say, give me a pen, give me a pen. You write it where? On your hand. Because if it's on my hand, I'm not going to forget it. I get home, my hand might be sweaty. I have a little ink mark, and I'm like, what that was that I left on my hand? Hallelujah. God is saying to Israel, hey, God, though I didn't have nothing to write with, hallelujah, I've engraven you upon the palms of my hands. I put you there. Your walls are ever before me. You're close to me. You're right here. I'll never forget you. Don't you dare say that they are extinct. Don't you dare say that they're lost. Because God is saying, I know exactly where they are. And in these last days, he's going to reveal to us and to the earth the mystery of where he has hidden them. Oh, come on, somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah. Point number six. Arsareth. Arsareth. You ever heard that word before? Yeah, because they don't teach us nothing no more. They don't teach us nothing no more. Arsareth. Arsareth is an ancient place. It's an ancient land. Arsareth. Now, I want to take you to somewhere in the scriptures. Genesis 49 and 22 first. I want, want you, Sambud, if y'all can go there. In this section of scripture, Jacob is about to die. And we're going to talk about this section of scripture as we get into our chapters with Joseph and stuff like that. But right when Jacob is dying, Jacob goes prophetic, man. He lines his sons up all, hallelujah, and he begins to read them. And he read about what they've done, what they will do, and what's going on in their life right now. He's just prophesying on. Reuben, you're unstable like water. He just, he just reading them. And he, he not only tell them what's going on, but he's going to tell them what's happening with them and their people in the last days. Mm -mm -mm. Let me give you an example. In Genesis 49, he begins to talk about Judah. And that's us. All right? In 49, amen, he says, Hallelujah, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise, which our name Judah means praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. is a lion's cub, a lion's offspring. 
From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Y'all better not wake Judah up, he's saying, because that's a lion. In verse 10, Jacob tells Judah, he says, The scepter, which is a ruling baton that kings used to have, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Judah will always have the right of rulership in Israel, because God had promised it to David that he would always have a king sit on the throne. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Until what? Until Shiloh. Shiloh is another name for the end of days. Another name for the return of Christ. Another day of the return of Yahshua. The old folk used to say, I'm waiting until Shiloh. When Shiloh comes, it's judgment day. He said, and unto him, Judah, shall be what? The gathering of the people. Pastor, what that mean? That in the last days when God go to gather his people, he going to use Judah to gather his people. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on now. I know so just a few people got that. You see, it's Judah that's calling for the real people to awake again. It's Judah that's saying, wake up. It's Judah that's saying, you the people. It's Judah that's doing that. He said, unto Judah shall be the gathering of the people. They don't know who the ten tribes are. Judah going to know who the ten tribes are. And Judah going to call out and say, rally around me. Rally around me. That's what Judah going to do. Unto you shall be the gathering of the people. And Judah, you don't even know. You don't even know. I'm going to I'm tell you who the ten tribes are. But you don't even know what the ten tribes really think about you. Oh yeah, oh yeah, other nations in America think you ain't nothing, but listen, they got peoples in places that if you had to ask them about us, I didn't heard them conversate with me about us before and how we operate and how we do our thing. And a lot of these nations that I'm going to cover, amen, look up to us in a lot of ways. See, we've been low so long, hallelujah, that we say, how can anybody look up to us? But I want to tell you something, Judah. Oh, have mercy, somebody. Other nations are looking. And they can see your blessings. And they can see your leadership. And they can see your business savvy. See, one of the ways that God will raise his people up, he'll put you in Egypt to learn the ways of the Egyptians so you can know how to operate and how to move in Judah. We've been here a long time and we done learned some things. Oh, God. Y'all don't want me to go prophetic up in here. Come on, I'm trying to teach you something here. So, here we go, Anna. Here we go, Sergio. God begins to talk about Joseph, the other ten tribes, Ephraim. And through Jacob, he prophesies about Joseph. And in 49, 22, he said, Joseph, you're going to be a fruitful, how you say that word, baby? Bow, hallelujah, bow, hallelujah. How y'all say that when they a tree, tree, like a tree, bow, bow? Yeah, we're going to just say bow. Yeah, Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a well whose branches run over the wall. You see, Ephraim means fruitful. He said, Joseph, he said, you're going to be fruitful. But you're not just going to be fruitful in one place. You're going to be tr like a tree planted by water, Joseph. You're going to be a fruitful bow, 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 bow uh, planted by a well, a God. But you're going to be so fruitful that your fruit not just going to be in one place. That, hallelujah, you're going to be fruitful, amen, whose, your branch is going to be so wide, your branch is going to run over over what? Over the wall. Your branch is going to run over the wall. Meaning that everybody else is going to be right here, but you're going to be over the wall. You, you're going to be someplace where everybody else not. You're going to be over the wall, over the wall. Your branch is going to be over the wall. And commentators see this as Joseph and Ephraim and the ten tribes getting to a place where nobody else at. A place, hallelujah, an ancient place. A place that goes by the name of uh, Aserath. It was just a whispering place, a, 
a mythological, legendary place that not everybody knew existed, you see. And by the time we get to the Apocrypha, a lot of people don't want us to read the Apocrypha. When I was in seminary, they, they really didn't want us to get into that bunch, you see. But I'm growing to a place where I'm learning that the Apocrypha is very important for us to read. And I'm going to tell you why. In this book is the history of our people. And in this book where history is silent about the ten tribes, where we only have this scripture in Genesis about Joseph being in a place by himself over the wall, this Apocrypha is going to tell us exactly where the ten tribes are. Exactly. I wonder if they told us not to read it so we wouldn't find out what was in it. Woo! So as we look at 2nd Ezra, all right, and this is the same Ezra. I, mean, I don't know why we don't read this. This is Ezra, all right? It's spelled a little different. But in 2nd Ezra 13, 40, look what it says. See, Ezra had a dream, and he couldn't understand who, who some people was in the dream. He was like, who's that? Who's that I saw? And God said in 2 Ezra, verse 40, he says, those are the ten tribes. Ten tribes. The boy been gone. The boy is lost. <laughs> ten tribes. Who? There must be some other tribe from down the street. The boy from Macomb. The boy from Vizé. So God said, no, 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 no. These are the ten tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land. In the time of Hosea, the king, whoa, those ten tribes? No, 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 no. Assyria must have car carried out somebody else. No, 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 whom Salmanazar, the king of Assyria, led away captive. And he carried them over the waters. And so came they into another land. This is exactly what we said in history that Josephus said, that once they lost the northern tribe, they were transplanted into another land. Apocrypha goes deeper, 41. When they was in that other land, and Assyria fell, you see, nations fall, but Israel remained. Anybody hear me up in here? That's why I tell you, amen, get yourself ready. Because if ever America fall, Israel will remain. Anybody hear me up in here? Israel will remain. We're just going to have to come together and say, okay, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do? Because God got promises for us in the book of Revelation. We got to continue to exist, right? And so when Assyria fall, look what it says. They didn't just fall with Assyria. They took this council among themselves. They got together. And they said, yo, let us leave the multitude of the heathen and go forth into a, a further country. Somebody say a further country. Wait, 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 wait. What y'all talking about here? We need to get away from all these heathen. But wait, all the known world is filled with heathen. All the known world, I can show you an ancient map from the Mediterranean all the way through from China, amen, Russia. It's all filled with heathens. How in the world are you going to go into a further country away from the heathens? I'll tell you how. We're going to go to a country where never mankind dwelled. What? What? Was there a place in those biblical times where there was a land where nobody was living? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A place where never a man dwelt. Ain't never even walked there. Huh? I'm talking about, I'm talking about, look, ghost town. Just the animals. Right? All right? A wilderness. Why are we going to go there where the heathens are not? 42. That they might dare keep their statutes, which they never kept in their own land. Let's try it again, y'all. He, he got us out of our land, northern tribes, because we didn't keep. Let's try it again. We're going to try to keep his statutes. 43. And they entered into the Euphrates by the narrow places of the river, all right? Now, what I'm going to tell you is, is that when the ten tribes left Assyria, they began to travel and looking for a place where never mankind dwelt, all right? They had heard of it. They knew where it was, amen? And they was on their way there. There's two schools of thought, hallelujah, on how they got there. Number one, amen, uh, uh, there's a map that shows them leaving the Euphrates River and going by boat, you know what I'm saying, navigating all the way. Come on, give me a map. Come on, give me a map. And I think I got the map with the red line showing the track. There's a, that, yeah, yeah, go back, go back, go back, one back, one back. Here we go, there we go. You see that? 
they left Assyria through the Euphrates River. And there's a school of thought that says that they came through with the wind circuits and the, and the water currents, amen, and they traveled all the way to South America, all right? That's one theory, okay? Now, when you look at the pyramids down there and that African art down there, you would say, hmm, that's starting to make a little sense. But there's also a second theory. There's also a second theory. The second theory tells us, amen, that they didn't leave and take through water courses, all right? But they actually traveled east, all right? Traveling through India, amen, through the Oriental Asian, uh, uh, Asian uh, uh, countries, into China, into Russia. You see where it's going up? Going up, going up, uh, uh, into Siberia. I wish I could jump up there to show you all. The very top of that map up there, you see, on this side. Now, what you don't know is, is that the top of the map on this side is very close to the top of the map on that side. All right? Now, I'm showing you this depiction of the earth because that's what you're used to, but that's not what it really looked like. That dude is crazy. <laughs> Let me show you the United Nations flag. Let me show you that. This is what it really looked like. And the United Nations know that. That's why they put this depiction of what the earth really looked like. They hide the truth about what everything is right in front of our eyes. All right, all right, anyway, anyway. anyway. Give, me, give me the map, give me the map. Give me the, uh, the map with the red circle around it. All right, this is us. This, I'm so shocked. What you see? Oh, no, I can't get, oh, hallelujah. Oh, that deacon, that deacon is amazing. All right. Y'all, I'm going to come on that side later. All right. Oh, wait up. <laughs> Phil Romar, put that, put that picture back on that screen, Phil. All right, here we go. I bet that Phil, yeah. So, so they, they say they come like, like, like through here. And this is that tip of Russia. All right. But what you don't know is that tip is real close to Alaska, right? Very close. In fact, um, Russia had offered to build a bridge from Alaska uh, to this northern, tri uh, northern uh, section of Siberia uh, of Russia. America said no, of course, uh, but, but uh, and it would be a bridge, you know, uh, we build long bridges. We drive long bridges all the time, the Chafalaya, you know what I'm saying? It'd be a little longer than the Chafalaya, but it wouldn't be as long as the longest bridge in China. So we could do it. There was a bridge right there. All right? Has to get done. Let me show you a pic of this in clo close up. Go close up on me. Hallelujah. Switch it, switch it. Switch it again, switch it again. All right. That's it, close up. The only water that separates that, that northern tip from Alaska is a little, little little stray, a little, little channel called the Bering Strait, right? It's not long. You can build a bridge over it. Historians say that the ten tribes left Assyria. They went east. They were traveling looking for a land that nobody dwelt in, all right? They get to this place. How are they going to get across? Oh, God, how are they going to get across? Huh? What you don't know is that environmentally, every so often, that Bering Strait dries up. That's what you don't know. That's what you don't know. And they teach us about it, but they just say, oh, it happened. When they don't want us to know something, it happened millions of years ago. Because as soon as we hear millions, our, our head go off. We start thinking about, who texts me? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it wasn't millions of years ago. It wasn't 12, 20,000 years ago. I'm talking about maybe 3,000 years ago. This, this thing dries up. All right? Let me show you maps of what it looked like when it begins to dry up. It get bigger. It get closer. Come on, come on, do it again. To the point to where a whole nother little piece of land that they have a name for, they named it after the Bering Strait, Beringia appears. And when it dries up, that Beringia is not only a land bridge, but it's full of green grass and all kind of things. In fact, the animals, when this thing began to drop, the animals began to cross over. That's why scientists, they notice that the same animals over here where Russia is, the same animals that we have here and the same artifacts we have on this side, we have on that side. How in the world these people came across? It was a land bridge. It was a land bridge. It was a land bridge. Now watch what the Apocrypha said. Watch this. 
Watch this. Come on, we just studying a little bit. Y'all all right? Y'all all right? And, 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 and you see, I know the tribes. See, the tribes became nomads when they began to leave Assyria. So they, they following animals. And hallelujah, them brothers there, they looking at them buffalo. Wherever them buffalo gone, we going too. And that buffalo cross over, we going to cross over too. You know? So, so here we go, here we go, here we go. The Apocrypha says, amen, in 44, that they would look for this land, amen, hallelujah, where no man dwelt. And what the Most High would do, the Most High would help them. For the Most High then showed signs for them and held still the floods till they were passed over. He held it up. They walk across dry land. <laughs> now those of us who know anything about school, they taught us that people came and crossed over. But they're going to say millions of years ago, you know, just to throw us off. All right? But the ten tribes did cross over. You see, 45, look what it says. For through that country, there was a great way to go. This wasn't, this wasn't Bro Bridge and Lafayette. This was far. How long? Namely, a year and a half journey. And the same region is called Arsarath. Where they was going was a place called Arsarath. You see, I don't want to get into it too much because we're going to do it later. But what you need to understand was that when Columbus asked for permission to come to the Americas, the first word he called this place was Arsarat. When he was asking for permission, you, could, you don't even have to go read a book. Go watch the movie 1492. It's in the movie. He said, I want to go to Arsarat. And they asked him, they say, oh, how did you find out about Arsarat? He said, it's in the book of Second Ezra. And what you don't know is, is that out of all the people Columbus put on his boat to bring with him on the Santa Nina, well, what is it, the Pinta? Pinta Santa Maria? The Nina Pinta Santa Maria. It came back. Thank you, Lord. Out of all the people that he brought with him, he brought an interpreter. And guess what language he made sure that his interpreter spoke? Hebrew. Woo! You better go dig. You better go. How you knew that you was, how you knew? How you know when you got here, you was going to need to communicate with Hebrews? How you knew that? How you knew that? As a rat. You see? As a rat. You see? Yeah. Pastor, what you're saying. You see, these fellows who wrote in the 1800s, a view of the Hebrews, Pastor Ethan Smith, James Adair, Elias Boudinot, 1816, Congressman Boudinot, and people like William Penn, who founded the city of Philadelphia, and, 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 and Pennsylvania, rather, uh, is named after him. They had a theory back then. The theory was, was that the people we called the Indians Who, when they got to America, they say, you know, not, not Columbus knew, but everybody else is like, what are all these people doing here? See, back in those days, the 1800s, <laughs> most people knew of the theory that the Native Americans were the ten tribes. Most people knew that. Most people knew that. It was preached in church. That's why, listen, I got pastors, man. The testimonies, they pastors, missionaries, man. Missionaries. And I'm talking about not just pastors, no, but pastors that we learn about in English. Sinners of the hands of an angry God. Jonathan Edwards, his son was a missionary amongst the Indians, and his son knew that they were the people. His son knew. They knew it. They always knew it. They knew it when Columbus stepped foot on the land. They knew it. And I'm going to show you. The next few weeks and months, I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you so much evidence, it's going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your mind. Because when I talk about the people of God, you will see them and know them by the curse, by the judgment. Let me tell you, another group of people who done had it rough, who done experienced a lot of uh, depression and all manner of wickedness done to them, not only the Hebrews, hallelujah, not only African Americans, amen, 
with them Native Americans? Reading their history make you want to weep. Make you want to weep. But we had good white men, good Caucasian Europeans stand up and write books about it. And say, oh, no, 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 y'all ain't going to just let this slide and hide this under the rug. No, 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 no. We won't let y'all know. We'll let y'all know in 2018, huh? Keep the record that we always thought they was the people. And we're going to give you the evidence of it. Listen to me good. Listen to me good. All right? Listen to me good. All right? When we come next time, look, we're going to study all manner of kind of things. And I got stuff bubbling up in me that I want to tell you right now. I just, I don't want to hold it. Let me tell you one. Let me tell you one. <laughs> Did you know when they first came, not Columbus, but the settlers? Pilgrims? <laughs> Brother Abby, you, you, you know who they brought with them to communicate with these Indians? They bought them slaves from West Africa. Now, how Tyrone gonna communicate with Geronimo? How what, what Tyrone and Geronimo know? That's what Tyrone come up in there. And that Indian come up in there, and them all looking at each other, checking each other. He big like me. And they would communicate. Check out the explorers Lewis and Clark. Find out who the God of Lewis and Clark was. Black man by the name of York, a slave. One of the greatest assets to the expedition. Without York, Lewis and Clark could tell you, the expedition of, 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 of finding out the West would have never happened because York was their liaison to negotiate with the Indians and talk with them. They could understand each other. Woo! <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, listen, we saw it. We saw it. Now, now, all right. When we look at the American Indians today, they don't look like they used to look. No. In fact, you know, they mess history up a lot. So the pictures we see of them back then, they only take the pictures of the most lightest kind. When we was in the museum and, and we was looking, you know what I'm saying? I, we was in Cincinnati. That was in Cincinnati. So we walking through, and I, I thought I saw a black man. I, I said, what that black man doing up here? Boy, had all kind of feathers on and stuff like that. And I look close. I said, that's an Indian. Or rather, a Native American. See, because he ain't from India. Why you won't call him an Indian? That's to throw you off. So you'll never figure out who he really is. So you'll never question where he really came from. <laughs> well, just put a name on, call him an Indian. You know? But they look different. Now, now, now. All right, now today they, they mix, all right? So they, they got a skin complexion, you know what I'm saying? They used to be like Tyrone, now they like Jaleesa. You see what I'm saying? All right? They look a little different, all right? But don't let that fool you, all right? They look like Kimmy over there, all right? Don't let that fool you. Don't let that throw you off. I'm going to tell you why, okay? Randy, from that track, from Assyria, moving up, through what they call the Orient, which would be uh, the Asian places. You got Thailand, you got China, you got Japan, you got Indonesia, you got all those Oriental places, all right? Now the brothers leave Assyria and they, they marching up there. You know a little mixing gonna go on. You know how the brothers act. You understand what I'm saying? The brothers, <laughs> Lord have mercy, Jesus. The brothers, the brothers, the brothers. So now they're bringing children with some straight hair now. They're bringing children look like, you know, they, they got, got some slanted eyes. And they'll admit that the Indians have Oriental and Asian background. Yeah, you, they'll admit that. When we look at them, we could see that. But Cam, we also see something else. We also see as though it were Asian and a little bit of chocolate. We see a different skin color than just the Japanese and the Chinese. We see a mixture there. A mixture that once you think about it, and you say, yeah, his eyes slant. But he's big, he's strong, he, and he's brown, and he's red, and some of them, they blacked him. 
Somebody say, Israel. See, next time when we come, I'm going to start doing Hebrew nuggets right before the sermon. I'm going to do them about 10 minutes apiece. And we're going to go through and just show you all the different bits of information and proof that these, that these guys, amen, risked their life, amen, to enumerate. And you can't find these books everywhere. You can't find them everywhere. In fact, I kept wondering to myself, why ain't nobody taught us that? Why they didn't even tell us it's a theory? What's wrong with them? Why they ain't never told us that? You see? There was an artifact found in Ohio amongst the Indian mounds. They found a little casket, a little Indian burial ground. They opened it up. They had a, a skeletal figure, and they was holding something in their hand close to their chest. They take it out. They open it. Amen. It's a piece of rock, granite. And on it has got some appear to be letters and stuff. They don't know what it is. They're like, ooh, the Indians write bad. You know what I'm saying? And they just put it down. They find another one in Cherokee country, just like it. And they, whoa, that look funny. And they put it in the Smithsonian, but Smithsonian said it ain't worth nothing. They put it like in the storage. One day one of the Ashkenazis come and pick it up and they look at the, and they turn it right side up. They say, Y'all had it upside down. And they said, y'all know what this is? And they told a rabbi, no. They said, he said, where y'all found that? He said, Ohio, we found another one in Cherokee country. He said, y'all don't know what that is? He said, this is Hebrew. This is Hebrew. It's an ancient form of black Hebrew. And what you're looking at on this, this piece of rock is representative of the Ten Commandments. So, so how in the world if God only gave his commandments and his statutes to his people? And everybody else never had it. Hide in the world. These Indians would have a rock with the Ten Commandments on it before Caucasians came to settle in our Sarath in America. Listen to me now. Listen to me now. Columbus ain't discovered nothing, no. Columbus ain't discovered nothing. Ah, you know, ooh, look who we found. You knew it was that. Now listen, listen now. Huh? So they found one in Ohio, they found one in Cherokee country. Guess what God did? God made them, they was digging in Israel, homeland. And guess what they find? One just like it. A cross. What was God trying to leave clues for? What was God trying to say? Look, 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 I was seven point and we gone. Next time we come, I'm going to start a little process of showing you this. And it's important that we know this. Come on, put it, put it up there. We're going to go through them right quick. Hallelujah, I'm going to show you a little process. Amen. We're going to find the similarities between the original Hebrews, uh, the original ten, amen, and, and, and the Indians. We're going to find out, amen, that the way they call themselves tribes is not happenstance. Other people call themselves clans and this and that. They call themselves tribes because we've been calling ourselves tribes when we came out of Egypt. They call themselves tribes. Amen. And I'm going to go even deeper. Every tribe had an animal. Oh, God. Judah had a lion. Joseph had a, had a, had a donkey. Amen. And when you get coming to the Americas, amen, they would associate themselves as the tribe of the wolf. There's a tribe of the hawk. There's a tribe of the eagle. They, they, oh, God. Have mercy. You don't want to know that. You, you don't want to know about the headdress. You don't want to know about, man, come on, man. Listen here. These fellas in these books are going to say that the Indians from Alaska all the way down to South America is all one family, one people. They speak a little different deri 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 derivations of, of the language, amen, but the Indian and Alaska can come on down, hallelujah, back in that day, come on down to North America, and they could still deal with the Indians in North America and the Indians in South America, Central America. They, they could have still deal, you know? Not only that, amen, not only the same family. When the Indians first came, they worshiped one God. And they had a name for him. They called him El. El what? Oh, what well, they call him El. And El in the Hebrew is God. And we, because we, let me, let me help you out there, El, El Shaddai. El, 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 Yon, uh, uh, Elohim. And they call him El. They call him El. 
And then when they were singing their songs, amen, we would make fun of them, amen, hallelujah. But we wasn't listening to what they were saying in their songs. They would call him Yahweh. Ooh, God. Yahweh, Yahweh. And they'd be there, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. And we just like, oh, yeah, that sounds fun. It's got a little beat to it. They can, get, they can keep a beat. We out there won't dance and stuff. Stop dancing and listen to what these people saying. They're saying Yahweh. They're saying Yahweh. And so these boys chronicle it in these books, and they say, they don't want to say Yahweh, they would say hallelujah in their songs. They would just break it down. Hallelujah. And they would just, they'd just break it down. I can't do it like them. You know what I'm saying? Come on, give me another one. Give me another one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They talk about that the elders say that they once had a covenant with God. You see? We're going to talk about all of that. The elders say stuff like that. The elders talk about the flood with Noah. They talk about all that stuff. Come on, keep on going. Hallelujah. I talked about hallelujah already. Come on, you got another one for me? Hallelujah. They would practice religious feasts. We're going to look at those and see the similarities. Amen. Hallelujah. They would, uh, they would never eat the hollow of an animal's hip. It was a part of a Hebrew tradition that since uh, uh, Jacob wrestled with the angel and the angel touched the hollow of his hip, that in honor of Jacob, they would never eat the hollow of an animal's hip. And we kept that while we was in Israel. And we find, hallelujah, uh, Indians in this strange land keeping the same thing. You know, give me another one. Give me another one. Hallelujah. Clean and unclean animals. Amen. You'll find even in the, in the Puritan writings and the writings of the, of the early settlers, amen, they was eating all kind of stuff. They was eating pig. They was eating this, that. The, the Indians didn't eat all that. They didn't eat all that. Because the Indians had a thing that, hallelujah, they said if you eat something, you're going to begin to act like what you eat. So they wouldn't eat unclean animals. All right? And if anything died on its own, amen, they wouldn't cook it. And there was one interview, amen, with, with, a, with a, a Caucasian lady, and she was, she, uh, the Indian lady was kind of her helper in the house. And, and the Indian lady, she come home, she said, I thought I told you to cook this. And the Indian lady said, that thing died. I ain't cooking that. Now, they didn't know why they was doing it. It was like tradition. But that's Old Testament law, man. You know? All right, come on, let's look at it. Amen. Hallelujah. They uh, used to practice uh, circumcision. When they first came to America, circumcision was something they did. And we know that that's a sign of the people. Amen. Go, come, on, come on down with me. Uh, women apart during there, you know, one time. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. The women would separate, just like in Israel. Cities of refuge, amen. Uh, if you kill somebody accidentally, you can go to a place and not suffer the revenge of a loved one. Uh, in their temples, amen, they had in their temples a holy of holies, a place where only the priests could go. And in these writings, they don't teach us that in school, Keith. In their writings, they would create a box with the angels on it. They, they was trying to rec recreate the Ark of the Covenant. In the, Indian, in the Indians, history. They don't teach us that. All right? Keep on going. Amen? We're going to talk about their yearly sacrifices of atonement. Amen? What else y'all got? Hallelujah. That's it? Well, praise God. That's it. Praise the Lord. Come on, give God some glory. All right? So as time goes, we're going to kind of just go through this. Amen? And talk about all of that. All right? You say, Pastor, well, what's the deal? What does that have to do with us? Well, unto Judah shall be the gathering of the people. It's going to be our job, amen, not only to gather our own people, but the peoples who can trace their heritage to the Native American. Now, let me break this down to you, all right? Uh, they probably had about 150 million Native Americans when Columbus and the settlers came, okay? Uh, statistics show they probably got about 5 million. They maybe have more on reservations. Uh, I talked to people like Chris Kopp in Alaska who deal with a lot of the Native Americans in Alaska, and they're some of the most depressed people. They have the highest rates of suicide, alcoholism, uh, 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 homicide amongst each other. And they got a lot of problems, problems kind of like us. And uh, uh, in all the different places where they at, even in America, the, 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 uh, the inward states, they have their own reservations. They give them the casinos. They have a lot of bunch of money. They give them a lot of programs. They can make their own laws. So they have a bunch of money. They got programs. They got their own laws. And they're still in a low state. It appears to me 
that their problem is not money. It appears to me that their problem is not programs to help them out of their situation. Just like us, they have a covenant problem. Just like us, they have a God problem. And they have to come back to Yahweh. They have to come back to Yahshua. They got to stop worshiping different spirits and dressing up like Mardi Gras and getting that liquor in them and stuff like that. We'll talk about even that because the Bible talk about Ephraim and their predisposition to alcohol. It's all in the word. If they come out of that and turn to Yahshua Jesus and rally around Judah, God's going to restore everything that the devil took from them in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. All right? And that's what's going to happen now. That's those on the reservations. What you don't know is, is that they got people groups who are not on the reservation, who have Native American in them strongly. I said, what you're talking about? Huh, baby. Just go right across the Rio Grande, and there's a whole country that derives its ancestry from the Native American nation that we call the Aztecs, Montezuma and the boys. This, my friend, were Native Americans. This was the original seed of, of Abraham coming down all the way down, crossing the Rio Grande and starting an immense civilization with temples, hallelujah, and pyramids like we was building back in Africa. Did you know on the Mexican flag? That the bird that's on it with the hand on the, the, the snake, that was one of the signs of the Aztec nation. Pastor, give me the short of it. The Hispanic people, the Latino people, one side of their heritage come from the Europeans, Spain, the Dutch, and, and all the people that mix with them, but the other side come from the Native American. That is the connection that we've been waiting for, you see? But like us, we tend to want to be like our lighter complexion history and our lighter complexion ancestry. We don't want to know about Negro land. We just want to find out how much white we have in us. Anybody hear me up in here? That's how we are. I'm just keeping it real. That's how we are. We have, oh, I got 25%. Woo! But we don't want to know about Negro land. Same thing in Latino people. Amen. They won't know how much white they have. Just like us, we're doing our hair like that. We're doing our butt. You know, they do it. It's the same thing. The more white, the better. But what you, what you miss is, is that God will make the last first, then the first last. God will flip some things and show you the thing that you're running away from is the thing you should be running to. That's how the Latino people get in. That's the legacy, right? There. They come from the natives. They come from the natives. They come from, that's the people. You say, Pastor, but they're so much lighter than us. Hmm. You mix two and see what you're going to get. <laughs> so we'll talk about the Latino people, and we'll talk about the systematic programs of miscegenation that took place to lighten the sea, to discourage the original native population, the look, the, the color, Everything, the, the caste system, where the brighter ones were more wealthy and more powerful, and the darker ones that looked like the original people were the ones that was at the bottom. We'll talk about all of that. All of that. All of that. We just, woo, woo. My God. Now, Pastor, what do you mean? We got to get the word out. That's number one. Number two is, you better be careful who you're being mean to. You better be careful how you're treating people. You see, we walk around here treating our Latino brothers and sisters, our Native American brothers and sisters, like we somehow better than them or something. That's one family. That's one nation. Be careful how you treat them. Be careful how you act towards them. Don't be acting like that with them. And nothing burn me up more is when the Negroes try to act some kind of way with the Latino people. How in the world are you going to act some kind of way when you're in the same boat with them? How in the world are you going to? You better close your mouth. I wish I could get Sergio up here to tell y'all a piece of his mind. Listen. And when you see him, what in the world are you trying to speak Spanish to them for? Y'all see him, y'all want to, blah, 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 blah. you ain't got to do all that. Stop clowning. 
Now, if they would do that to you and start acting black when they see you, what's up, bruh? <laughs> you would start tripping. Man, be you, man. Treat the people with respect, bro. That's our people, man. Israel and Judah, two sticks, shall become one. I want you to look at North America, from Alaska all the way down, and all those people that's there, and all the Latino people from the Native American ten tribes, and all of the Judah people from Judah. Isn't it ironic that God would take us and put most of us in the same geographic area during these last days? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Oh, yeah, it's something. It's a last day's mystery that's coming to pass. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. Hallelujah. We got to get out of here. We got to get out of here. Isaiah eleven eleven is our last scripture, and then we're going to leave. Amen. Hallelujah. L listen to this good. All right. We're revealing some mysteries. And if you don't believe me, you go back and you do your own research. Go back and do your own research. Get you some books. Don't just look at YouTube, amen, because I see a lot of stuff, but I don't believe everything I see until I research it with my Bible, with the historical books. Then I can come and say, bunch, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But Isaiah 11, 11. It's the last day's prophecy. God says this. And it shall come to pass in that day, the last days, that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from where? From Assyria? I ain't forgot about you. From Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and that Cush is Africa, by the way, and from the islands of the sea, that be Europe and America, Barbados, Jamaica, Haiti, from the islands of the sea, St. Lucia. You understand what I'm saying? In verse 12, he's not only going to gather them, he shall set up an ensign. He's going to gather them around a sign, one sign, a sign for the nations. He's going to assemble the outcasts of Israel, that's one, and gather together the disperse of Judah. From where? From the four corners of the earth. Come on, give God some glory. One people. One people. Could you imagine the Latino people and Judah coming together? Could you imagine that? Could you imagine that coming together and love coming together and, 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 and peace coming together? Huh? Could you imagine that? Could you imagine that? And not just Latino and Judah, but we got white brothers and sisters who did things like this, who did things like this, who have in their heart not just, hallelujah, my race, but have in their heart truth. Anybody hear me up in here? And when all those people shall come together, woo, God have mercy, you know? But the key is, is that God says, I'm going to set up an inside. They're just not going to come together on their own. They're going to rally around a, in, a sign. They gonna rally around a sign. They gonna rally around the cross. This group can't come together unless the cross is at the center of it. Jesus says, "If I be lifted up, that's when I'ma draw all men unto me." So when we go on the reservation. We preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. When we go to South America with interpreters, we preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. We tell them, yeah, y'all the people, but even as the people, you better be saved. You better be born again. You better come under the blood. Don't you dare go under the old covenant. You come and you admit you're a sinner. You believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all your sins. He was buried on the third day. He rose from the grave. And you confess him as your Lord. You open your mouth and you say, Jesus is Lord. I'm telling you prophetically, that's going to be a revival. It's going to be a revival. 
And you're about to see something happen in the earth that you've never seen before. Peoples are going to come to the cross. Even though I present to you Bible, history, and all of these literature books, look, you still don't have to believe me. Prophetically, you will believe. You know why you're going to believe? Because you're going to see the gathering. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> you're going to see the gathering? You're going to see the gathering. The Native Americans going to come. The Latinos going to come. And there's others. There's others. We're we going to just do the Native Americans. But there's a whole string of peoples along that trek from Assyria. But unless I talk to you too much, we got a lot left to talk about. Got a lot left to talk about. God told Abraham, he said, I will make you the father of nations. Not just one nation. Nations. That look different and talk different. Nations. Pray with me now. Say, God, our Father, Yahweh, I thank you for last day's truth. I thank you, Lord, for uncovering the lies of wicked men. We ask you to show us what is, what was, and what is to come. And we thank you for being so faithful. Now, Lord, I admit I've sinned against you, and I'm so sorry. But I believe that Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Hamashiach, died on the cross for all my sins. I believe he was buried and on the third day he rose again. Lord, save me a sinner and reunite your people just as you said. And Father, if you want to use me here am I. And Father, if I doubt, show me. Teach me. You said if I lack wisdom, that I should ask, Lord God, show me if what pastor's saying is the truth. Gather us. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I kept you too long. Could you stand for your blessing here? We're going to get out of here. Remember, we got the HBA and WHBA, man, at 3 o'clock at Progressing. You can come and sit and watch some basketball. Amen. Glory to God. I got so much stuff to tell you in the next few weeks. Hallelujah. But here we go. We got to get out of here. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. My sister. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you, young man. May he lift up his countenance upon you and yours and bless you with shalom peace. May you know who you are and whose you are. And may you know all your brothers and sisters in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Love y'all. Be blessed. Be blessed.